Mary Magdalene stayed outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and then reported what he had told her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The tomb of Jesus is for Mary Magdalene a place of intense sorrow, but also intense joy. We hear in the Gospel that she approaches this tomb and she's weeping. She's weeping because of who Jesus was for her. Jesus was an authentic friend. He was the heavenly friend. He was the one that gave her true love and true acceptance and hope. He was the one who gave her this grace of salvation. And he has died. And as Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, she's going to a thing that is a sign for her that the greatest person in her life is gone. Therefore she weeps. Her weeping must have been part of her very deep nature, part of her personality because of who Jesus was for her, something that would never leave her heart. The pain of losing Jesus was so great. It's also a painful situation because it says it's as if her prayer received the answer from God, no. She goes to the place where Jesus is gone, and she doesn't know where they put him. So she has intense, intense sorrow. But also, it's a place of intense joy because she encounters Jesus in his resurrection. You must imagine that was an explosion of joy that came to her heart. Jesus is alive and he's real. He's right here. This joy becomes so powerful that it leads her to become what we call the Apostle to the Apostles. She's the first person to announce the Gospel. She's the best evangelizer. It's as if she was the first person that Jesus trained in the mission of evangelization. You know, this Gospel has often been used as a means to say a special thank you to all women who have helped the Gospel message go forth throughout the world down through the centuries. And there are so many women who help out the Church in this regard. You can think of women who are catechists and religious education teachers, women involved in music ministry and preparing the church for mass and cleaning the sacristy and arranging things. And many women have been, even today, an apostle to the apostles, making sure that the gospel is handed on in one way or another to all people. And so we have to be very grateful to all the women who have helped us so much in the mission that Jesus gives to all of us to bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus' resurrection to everyone. She becomes an apostle to the apostles and she does so with joy. Jesus is risen and he is with her. The greatest friend she's ever had is with her and will never, never abandon her. This joy of resurrection is, like her sorrow, part of her personal life story now. It's going to be with her for all eternity. Now, Mary Magdalene, in a way, goes to a kind of process. It's like a spiritual process. She has intense sorrow and so she goes to the tomb, and that is kind of like a prayer. It's like an action she takes with her sorrow. She doesn't just have her sorrow, but she does something with it. She prays. And then when she prays, she humbles herself. It says that she bent over into the tomb. In other words, her prayer is not the kind of prayer of, let me tell God what to do, but it's a prayer of humility. Let me see what God's will is. And it's in this humility that Mary Magdalene encounters heaven in this world. 
she sees two angels. Now the angels are all around us, but they don't always show off like they do here in the Gospel. Sometimes they do. Mary Magdalene has a case where the angels show up and they show off. They're there. She can see them. If she hadn't humbled herself, she would have missed out on encountering God working intimately in her present life situation. She encounters heaven alive and active in this world. And then the next thing she does is she opens her mind to see where divine providence will lead her. This requires her to trust in divine providence. That encounter with the angels is something that she put her trust in. And then she opened her mind to see where God was going to lead. And that led to this man that she doesn't understand. Maybe he's the gardener, but who is Jesus himself? She has this living encounter with Jesus. So we can learn from Mary Magdalene. You know, many of us have a sorrow or many sorrows that we carry in our hearts. Some of our sorrows that may not be on the surface, we might not think about them all the time, but they're with us. They're with us all the time. Like Mary Magdalene, they're part of our identity. Let's imitate her. We take our sorrow and we don't just hold on to it. We don't just wallow in it and feel bad for ourselves, but we bring this to prayer. And to a kind of prayer that is not us telling God that we're smarter than Him and we know exactly what He has to do, but the prayer where we ask for God's strength. We ask for His wisdom and guidance. Then we move with our sorrow, with humility. We humble ourselves in our prayer. We seek to do not our own will, but God's will. This humility can call us to examine our own life, to make sure that we're on the right track spiritually before God and before others, that we are living the great command of love. We humble ourselves to try to seek God's will. We trust in divine providence. We trust that how God is working in our present situation is something that we can follow. We can move forward with one step at a time. And then we open our minds to see where divine providence will lead us. And God works in our present life situations. You know, there's a good book called Abandonment to Divine Providence by Jean-Pierre de Cossard, and he talks about there being eight sacraments. We know there are seven, but he says the eighth sacrament is the present moment. If you think about it, the only thing you have right now and that I have is this present moment. We don't have anything else. It's the only thing we have possession of, and it's in this present moment that we have God. Just like Mary Magdalene in this present moment at the tomb, she had heaven right there. She had Jesus. So let us try to imitate Mary Magdalene's process of prayer, her spiritual steps. With whatever sorrow or pain or confusing situation we have, we take it to prayer. We take it to humility and seek God's will. We trust in God's providence and we open our mind to see how He's going to lead us. In this way, we will encounter Emmanuel, Jesus, who is risen and is God with us. God bless you.